King, our sponsor today, Eli Lilly and company, not only for their generous support of today's program, but also for coming to the council with the idea for this program many months ago. They've been great partners in planning today's event over the last few months. I'd also like to acknowledge Sean Malone from the New England Council, who uh, worked very, very hard on today's uh, program. It's been a very busy fall for the New England Council. I'd like to take a quick moment to tell you just about a few other upcoming events. Later this week, we'll be hosting a virtual program looking at the impact of the Landmark Inflation Reduction Act on the region's energy uh, landscape. Next week, we look forward to hearing from Congressman Jim McGovern, the Chairman of the House Rules Committee at a Capitol Hill report breakfast across town at the Seaport Hotel. And last, but most certainly not least, I hope all of you will be joining us on November 7th for our 2022 annual celebration. We will be honoring several incredible New Englanders of the year, and we are thrilled to be finally, finally be able to hold this event in person. Many, many thanks to all of you who have already sponsored the annual celebration. And if you have not yet, there is still time, but uh, Larry uh, Zabar has indicated some 210 tables have been sold at 10 people, 10 uh, at a table, which is like 2,100 people. Uh, so this is going to be a big, uh, big, big event. But there's still time if you haven't made a, uh, a commitment. Today we're delighted to be resuming our New England Innovates series, which has been on hold since the pandemic hit. Our goal in the series is to explore different topics related to the region's innovation economy, look at key challenges and opportunities for our region, and consider how federal policymakers can contribute to support innovation here in New England. In the past, we've looked at topics ranging from cybersecurity to fintech to autonomous vehicles. And today, we take a look at the region's incredible leadership in neuroscience research, particularly as it relates to combating Alzheimer's disease. I doubt there is anyone in this room who doesn't have some firsthand experience with this disease, whether a relative or a friend who has faced this devastating uh, disease. Not only does Alzheimer's disease impact individuals and their families, it has also had a significant economic impact and is a driver of health care costs. The good news is we have some incredible business and organizations right here in New England who are working tirelessly to treat this disease and find a cure. We also have leaders in Washington who are fighting for more federal investment in research and innovation to combat this and many other diseases. And we're going to hear from many of them here today. To introduce our keynote speaker, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Andrew Adams, the Senior Vice President for Neurodegenerization at Eli Lilly and co-director of the Lilly Institute of Genetic Medicine. As many of you know, Lilly has a R&D hub just across the river in Cambridge and is a global leader in the Alzheimer's research and treatment. I thank all of you again for joining us today. And again, thanks to Lilly for their extraordinary and generous sponsorship. Dr. Adams, the floor is yours. I want to thank the New England Council for hosting today's event on Alzheimer's disease innovation. This is a really critical time in the fight against Alzheimer's disease, and I know many of us in the research field are really engaged and excited about what's happening in, in the near term. Uh, in my role, I'm Andrew Adams. I'm the Senior Vice President and Director of the Lilly Institute for Genetic Medicine here in Boston. Uh, Lilly, as you know, has been a part of this extraordinary region for several decades, including in Cambridge, with the last seven years of, of building up our sites there. However, we're really excited that in 2024, the new Lilly Institute for Genetic Medicine will open in the Boston seaport. It represents a major investment and really the next step in our strategy to invest in RNA and DNA-based therapeutics to combat diseases like Alzheimer's. It's an exciting new class of medicines that we feel target the root cause of diseases and is going to fuel the development of genetic medicines over the next couple decades. 
Already, 20% of the Lilly portfolio is made up of genetic medicines in areas like neurodegeneration, immunology, diabetes, and oncology. One of the reasons we decided to house the Institute in Boston is obviously because of its diverse scientific community. At Lilly, we believe in the power of diversity, equity, and inclusion to fulfill our purpose of creating medicines that make life better for people around the world. At our core, we believe that by leveraging the diverse backgrounds of our employees, we can deliver better scientific breakthroughs, and we can think of no better place to do that than Massachusetts. We're pleased to sponsor today's discussion on Alzheimer's disease and innovation, and are honored to have Senator Markey with us today. Alzheimer's is a relentless disease, as many of us who have personal connections know. People lose their memories, their independence, and then ultimately their lives. It's a long and painful journey for the individual, their caregivers, and their entire families. The statistics are alarming and becoming worse. Today, there are more than 6 million Americans aged 65 or over living with dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. And that number is predicted to double by 2060. Nearly two-thirds of Alzheimer's disease patients are women. And black and Hispanic Americans are more likely to have Alzheimer's, but less likely to be diagnosed than white Americans. Lilly has been committed to Alzheimer's research for more than 30 years. We're proud of the progress we've made. Our pipeline is aimed at the entire spectrum of Alzheimer's, including disease-modifying therapies that target the underlying causes of the disease, symptomatic therapies, and imaging and blood biomarkers to support the potential for earlier detection. We're just as committed to supporting meaningful policies, though, that lead, the best, lead to the best possible patient outcomes. And this ensures access to both advanced diagnostics and therapeutics for people living with early symptomatic Alzheimer's disease. We must also put policies in place that support healthcare providers in their efforts to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. For people at the earliest stages of Alzheimer's, there may be soon multiple innovative treatment options that can slow the progression of their disease, giving them independence for longer. We're optimistic about the future in the fight against Alzheimer's, and we remain hopeful for patients and their families. The Alzheimer's community is pleased to have Senator Ed Markey as a distinguished leader in government to support policies and research, uh, resources that provide hope to people with this disease. Senator Markey has worked tirelessly to protect and strengthen Medicare and Medicaid benefits for those who are most vulnerable in our society, including people with Alzheimer's. He's also been a steadfast advocate in Congress for health and medical research, notably in the fight against this disease. Among his many legislative accomplishments, he spearheaded the passage of the National Alzheimer's Project Act through the House where he served for 37 years. Signed into law in 2011, the NAPA was a landmark effort to aggressively address Alzheimer's disease and work towards the goal of preventing or effectively treating the disease by 2025. Serving as the co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Task Force on Alzheimer's Disease, he fought for $3.1 billion for Alzheimer's and dementia research at the NIH and advocated for access for patients to the therapies that they need. We're so pleased that Senator Markey could be with us today to share his vision of Alzheimer's, particularly with the NAPA goal of 2025 right around the corner. Following the Senator's remarks, a panel of council members will discuss the economic impact of the disease, challenges, and opportunities for us as a community for innovation to cure Alzheimer's disease, and how federal policymakers can support the continued neuroscience innovation in the region. Please join me in welcoming Senator Markey. Thank you, Andrew, and um, thank you to Eli Lilly for sponsoring this event, for your leadership uh, in research uh, and finding the cure for Alzheimer's. Uh, we're so fortunate to have you here in the state of Massachusetts, and we very much appreciate um, we very much appreciate um, everything that you are doing for our community. Uh, to Jim Brett. Uh, let's be honest, the more we think about it, Jim Brett is the organizing principle of our lives. Okay, so we're so lucky to have Jim, who uh, on politics, on science, on technology, 
uh, on the economy. Uh, Jim is our organizing principal, and uh, I've been fortunate to know him uh, from the uh, beginning of recorded time, and I'm just so <laughs> great to be here with you. Uh, and. Uh, and to be invited to speak on a subject which is near and dear to my heart. Um, my mother was um, one of five girls uh, in Malden, in you know the, the, the five daughters of two immigrants to Malden, and uh, she was the second oldest. When she was a junior in high school, she was president of the senior class, moving into uh, her senior year when my grandmother died. And there was no federal uh, programs in place at that time. And so the program was, one of the girls is gonna stay home. And that was my mother. The older girl went off to work. My mother became the mother, the single mom, for the three younger sisters, and that was just the way it was. Girls don't go to college. So she had to raise that family, uh, and then she had me. She married the milkman when she was 37. My father was 33, uh, the milkman, and she had me at 39 and my twin brothers at 40. And so, yeah, they had to leave Ireland. They weren't doing too well. The grandmother dies, and along comes the Great Depression and World War II. They're not doing too well. But my mother was committed to making sure that her three boys were not going to be a victim to those kinds of vagaries in, in the world. So she made sure that she took care of us in a way that we would maximize our God-given abilities. Now, she never had calculus, but she could do calculus at the kitchen table for fun. She never had trigonometry, but she could do trigonometry at the kitchen table for fun. The math gene goes through the female side of our family. <laughs> I could not do those things for fun. They were hard. I could talk about it, but I could not do it easily. So when my mother got Alzheimer's, uh, my father said, Eddie, we're keeping your mother in the living room in Malden. She's never going to step foot in a nursing home. It was an honor that she married me. I was a graduate of Lawrence Vocational High School. Now, my father was a milkman. And the strongest people at that time in our society were milkmen because milkmen have to lift six milk bottles in either hand all day long every single day beginning at 5 a.m. in the morning. The right arm of a milkman was about the size of my upper thigh. <laughs> you did not want to get on the wrong side of it, I will tell you that, if you are one of the sons in that family. And, uh, and as a milkman, he was able to keep her at home in the living room, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, on 7 Townsend Street in Malden, where, as a congressman, I continued to leave, live as I commuted back and forth <clears throat> there with my father on 7 Townsend Street. So when she passed away, uh, my father um, was finally relieved of all of these responsibilities, but we had learned a lot from my father including the fact that the one benefit you got was someone one hour a day who came into the home in order to take care of your loved one. One hour a day, a visiting nurse. And then you had to take care of the other 23 hours. So it was illegal for my father to take my mother to Mass on Sunday at the Immaculate Conception Church because it was called the homebound amendment. If the person could leave the home for any reason, you did not get that benefit of one hour a day. It was illegal to have my mother walk with the carriage at the stop and shop with my father. It was illegal for my father and I to take my mother down to Revere Beach 
and then I would go over and get the clam plate and bring it back over and then just sit so my mother could look out at the ocean. That was illegal. Now, how much did that help my father to be able to do that? A lot. How much did it help my mother? A lot. How much money did it save the federal government if my mother had to go to a nursing home instead? A fortune. So families with Alzheimer's have heroes in the family who are taking care of these people, especially in those earliest stages. And so after she passed away, it took about a year, and then what I did was then found the Alzheimer's caucus in Congress in 1999. It took about a year to get over it because we had her in the living room for 13 years. So um, there was no caucus for Alzheimer's. There was for many other diseases, but the funding levels for uh, Alzheimer's were reflected in the fact that there was no Nash, there was no caucus. There was no political organization. We had the Alzheimer's Association, thank goodness, but we needed to do a lot more work. So I did it on a bipartisan basis because Alzheimer's is a bipartisan disease. It has no idea what party you are in. It affects everyone, every family, equally in terms of statistical probability. So, uh, in the year 2000, I passed my first law, and that was to outlaw the homebound amendment. No one should have to lie, although some Republicans were saying to me at the time, people are going to lie so that they can have people who will come into the house for an hour a day. And I would say to them, trust me, no one's going to lie that their mother or father or loved one has Alzheimer's. That is not going to happen. It took me actually two years to get that repealed. So then I began to build this caucus. Um, the Senator, Senator Collins and Hillary Clinton became the Senate co-chairs of my Alzheimer's caucus. Uh, and then over on uh, the House side, I ensured that it was Senator Smith, Republican from New Jersey. So then we began a long journey towards building our political clout in Congress, but again, we were catching up with other diseases in terms of funding at the National Institutes of Health because there were huge coalitions. And again, one of the paradoxes of Alzheimer's is that the one group that has a very difficult time in advocating for themselves are Alzheimer's patients. Pretty much every other disease has survivors who can then come to the marches. And that's not Alzheimer's. There are no survivors. There's no one who is there to be part of that movement. So in 2010, um, uh, 2011, Andrew mentioned, I, I created a, a bill which was the, the National Alzheimer's Project Act because what was ticking me off, to be honest with you, was that at the National Institutes of Health, they have 13 institutes. And the National Institute of Infectious Diseases didn't share information about the brain with the National Institutes of Aging or the National Institutes. So they all had information on the brain, but they didn't share it. It was all siloed. So that law said all silos are destroyed. Any information about the brain has to go into a common, common research pool so that Alzheimer's and other brain-related diseases could have that information. Then in 2014, uh, the uh, Alzheimer's Accountability Act. The Alzheimer's Accountability Act um, was, was intended to make up for all the lost time on Alzheimer's. So what it said to the NIH was that each year, NIH had to tell the Appropriations Committee how much money did they need in order to find the cure by 2025? So this is 2014. So that passes. In 2014, the NIH budget for Alzheimer's research was 400 million. My goal was to create a 25 
billion dollar research program by 2025. And so each year, as we get closer, especially to 2025, NIH has to send a number to find the cure by 2025. Last year, it was 3.4 billion. This year, it's going to be more. And by 2025, it will be $25 billion in research money that went out to the smartest young scientists in America to find the cure. Because a vision without funding is an hallucination. You have to fund it. You have to create the incentives to do it. And then that basic research goes into the hands of Eli Lilly and other corporations uh, who can then take it and run with that basic information. Uh, and then as each year has gone by, we have seen more and more breakthroughs, but without ultimately seeing that major breakthrough that everyone uh, wants to see. But none, nonetheless, the goal has to be that we'll reach a point where children can look to the history books to find that there ever was such a disease as Alzheimer's. And we have all of these brilliant people now working on that issue. The, the work that's being done in Kendall Square uh, is work that uh, is absolutely critical, not just to our country, but to the entire planet. As Andrew said, when 12 million people have Alzheimer's, or 15 million people have Alzheimer's, the Medicare and Medicaid budget for providing services to those families will equal the defense budget of the United States of America by 2050. That's where we are. We hear debates right now, should we continue to fund Ukraine in their war? How about framing it another way, our own war here? Domestically, should we continue to fund and dramatically increase the funding to find the cure for Alzheimer's? Otherwise, one disease will be equal to our defense budget every single year, and no one's going to be voting to cut the programs that will allow grandma and grandpa to be in a nursing home. No one has the nerve to do that. So just assume that that's going to be the case. And if we're spending 200 or 250 billion a year right now on Medicare and Medicaid, 3.5 billion seems pretty cheap, doesn't it? as a cost-benefit ratio for the long term in order to get that result. When I was a boy, Kendall Square was the place where all of the smartest young people in America were hoping to go. Uh, it was where MIT was partnering with Houston to devise new technologies that could answer President Kennedy's challenge to put a man on the moon by the year 1969. And he said in 1961 at Rice University, we will have to invent new technologies, invent new metals, invent propulsion systems that will come back from um, the moon at twice um, the, the speed of sound and, uh, and uh, through heat half the intensity of the sun and we have to get it done in eight years and he said we will do it not because it is easy but because it is hard because we had to control the high frontier out of space against the Soviet Union we were in a race for our own existential ex uh, survival well after President Johnson won 1964, a lot of that work left Kendall Square. Uh, my older cousins, who all had the math gene, and were older than me because the younger sisters got married before my mother, because my mother had to stay home. So the younger ones that she raised all got married. And one was older, went to Boston College, summa in math. She went off to IBM to do work on the Fortran program. Nasser, another summa in physics, then a master's and a PhD. 
went off to NASA to work on the space program. That was the challenge of the time. Me, I kept looking at it. There had been a bypass of that math gene. And I decided I would advocate for science. <laughs> I would argue for, for science. So in 1970, the Apollo mission, it was intended to land on the moon. And in the midst of that mission, the wiring of the internal oxygen tanks caused a fire and then an explosion. And the team of astronauts radioed back, Houston, we have a problem. And Tom Hanks, who was on that mission, <laughs> then said, failure is not an option. And in that race against time, the Houston team mobilized to find a way to cool the landing module's overtaxed hardware with a mix of plastic bags and cardboard and tape. And they jerry-rigged the command, and the astronauts survived. It was an unprecedented mission to rewire the spacecraft. We are now in an unprecedented survival mission. And it's no longer a mission to the moon, it's a mission to the mind. And we have to find a way to rewire the brains of millions of Americans whose wires are on fire. We have to find a way to, to cool those brains, to give families hope. And all of you who have Alzheimer's know what it looks like in your living room or kitchen when those wires are on fire. And we have to give people hope that we can find the cure. So Kendall Square has now been moved from the mission to the moon to the mission to the mind. That's who we are. And we have to make sure that we find the money for research at unprecedented amounts. We give the help to families at home so they can take care of their loved ones. I was able in the, in the, uh, 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 the uh, Obamacare bill to build in a provision for independence at home to change the model so that hospitals and nursing homes kept people in their living room the way my father did, but with more financial support because one, families feel better about that, and two, it saves the system money. And Senator Wyden and I are working to make that a permanent program so that we listen to the family, so we give them the help and the hope which they need. So this is an incredible moment in time. Kendall Square, as a metaphor for all of Greater Boston and all of our tech firms, all of our biotech firms are at the center of this mission to the mind. Uh, and I thank each and every one of you who are here for all of the work which you do. Uh, we are a family, all of us who have had Alzheimer's in the family, uh, and we must now say failure is not an option. We will do everything we can, public and private sector, to find that cure for families in our country. Thank you all so much for everything which I do. Take one or two questions. Maybe I could ask. Okay, sure. First one. Um, you mentioned the the impact of uh, Alzheimer's on your on your mother. How all of a sudden the family willingly becomes the caregivers. What is the status on medical and family leave uh, in Congress and trying to help these families? Yeah, we were not able to add uh, medical and family leave. That was a Kirsten Gillibrand uh, bill. Uh, we tried very hard to get that into the American Rescue Plan, but there's an inexorable inevitability to ultimately it becoming the policy for our country as it is for most advanced industrial nations in the world. Uh, that will help families a lot um, to be able to cope with this issue. Not completely, but it gives them some help which they need. So that has to be absolutely 
uh, imperative. And by the way, I didn't mention that we're now, Susan, uh, Senator Collins and I and others are going to extend the Alzheimer's Accountability Act out to 2035 so that the funding level continues <laughs> to go higher and higher and higher um, uh, so that um, so that we draw the smartest young people in America into that, um, into that scientific research in the same way they took all of my smart cousins uh, into the program to be able to successfully put that man on the moon. Yes? Do we have a question from the floor? Somebody? Joanne? Joanne. Joanne. Thank you for talking about the impact on families, and I just wanted to make sure that you know you are aware of the uh, impact of a special group of families, and those are families who have been raising children with Down syndrome, only oh. to know that um, if they live long enough, they will all develop Alzheimer's, and you know, 50% by the age of 50, if people aren't aware, and hope that they would not be excluded from clinical trials just by the diagnosis of Down syndrome, because the key, maybe the answer lies with them. And, and thank you for raising that. Um, again, you know, we have to do a better job on education on this issue, how many people it ultimately impacts and who is disproportionately uh, impacted. Down syndrome is a huge part of this issue. Uh, Andrew uh, mentioned uh, that black and Hispanic families um, can in fact contract it at higher levels and they're less likely to uh, have it identified early enough in order to help them, but women contract it more than men. Part of that is that they live longer, but it still doesn't explain the total statistical probability that women will contract it more than men. And so to the extent to which um, my father said, it was an honor that your mother you know, married me, we're gonna keep her here in the living room, uh, the reality is that historically um, uh, women have been the caregivers uh, and they tend to get sick as well because they have, to, they have to take care of the milkman if he contracts it, right? And so the totality of this issue, the caregiving issue, just has to be better understood and better funded. We tried really hard uh, in the American Rescue Plan uh, to increase that funding dramatically for families. We failed, but ultimately, I think we will be able to get that done. That's gonna be a big part of the 2024 election cycle, uh, whether or not we reflect all the lessons that we learned during the pandemic uh, about uh, home care, Zooming, uh, and the assistance that we can provide for mental health, but for other purposes to people at home. Jim? Maybe one final question, because I know the Senator needs to uh, be on the on the road you have a yes sir just wait for the mic and Emily uh, Senator good seeing you again thank you uh, the uh, question I have is uh, five years ago six years ago you put together a concert by Glenn Campbell oh. uh, the Library of Congress and at that point, you mentioned to me that the re that everybody in the audience were Republican, that you didn't have to invite de Democrats to support uh, the uh, Alzheimer's legislation, but the Republicans uh, needed some persuasion. How has that moved forward? Is it truly bipartisan or not? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so, yeah, we had a little problem, to be honest with you, uh, with regard to NIH funding in general. Uh, President Bush, when he took over in 2001, his first goal was to have a trillion and a half dollar tax break. Uh, and we were on the road post-Clinton to have surpluses each year. They wanted to get the surplus out of the city. Well. You don't have a sur you do not have a surplus until you first decided what are your bills, what do you have to spend money on, and so I said at that point, what's going to now happen is the NIH budget's going to get cut every year. So in 2002, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the the budget went down, funding for Alzheimer's went down. 
uh, even though we could see that hundreds of billions of dollars were being spent over here in Medicare. So, so to the extent to which at that time, unfortunately it was partisan. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I brought Glenn Campbell, who had Alzheimer's, to Washington. And I asked him and his family, could, would he do a concert for me for the United States Congress at the Library of Congress in their beautiful theater, amphitheater. And then I just went member to member to member to member to member, all Republicans, begging them to come over. And I took Glenn Campbell into all of the key members' offices, and then I asked uh, them, what's your favorite song? And then Glenn would sing it for them. Wichita lineman, <laughs> you name it. Because he remembered the music. And a lot of people here with Alzheimer's know what I'm talking about. But then he could not really have a conversation. And I don't think he was a raving liberal Democrat, Glenn Campbell, I will tell you. And then they all came over to the concert. And that was my goal. It was just to show how bipartisan this has to be. And to the credit of Roy Blunt, who is a Republican senator from Missouri and others, they have now taken that approach, uh, which was my goal after all, you know, just to make sure that it was thoroughly bipartisan. And because of that, now coming out of the, all, coming out of the Appropriations Committee each year on a bipartisan basis, whatever the number is that NIH says they need to find the cure, they do it. And I really praise Roy Blunt and others for their work on the Appropriations Committee and making sure that that is the case. And by the way, Jim Garrett back here, his wife, he's raised $1 million to find the cure. Jim, just absolutely. So anyway, Jimmy. I thank you. Can I just ask one quick question yeah, sure. and then you leave? Sure. You, you talked about NIH could be a partisan issue. What if, if the House flipped or the Senate flipped, increase in NIH going forward, would it be partisan or have we done enough education on both sides that will continue the increase? Um, Roy Blunt is retiring. He only has two months left to go. Uh, but Susan Collins is committed, and many others are committed, just can, to continue on this pathway. I will, I will tell you that ultimately I do not think that we can fail, that we will be successful in ensuring that there's a continuation of this philosophy. Just going back to the beginning of my story with the homebound amendment, that you could not have one hour a day with a visiting nurse if your mother or your father could, you know, actually walk down the stairs and go to sit in the back row to go to church. So a number of Republicans started to stop me. And so what I had to do is go over in 1999 over to the other side and I just started asking Republicans, do you have anyone in your family with Alzheimer's? And I hit the jackpot. Dennis Hastert, the Speaker of the House, said, yes, my mother had it. And then I pointed out to the Republican who was stopping the bill. And he just said, that's going to end very soon. Okay? <laughs> so you have to do a lot of work, but you're going to find it's even. And these families are desperate. They need help. They need hope. And I'm very confident, Jim, that on a bipartisan basis, Congress will continue to provide the funding to make that possible. Thank you all so much. Thank you to Jimmy, as usual. And the also, I just, but we also need, we also need heroes. And the senator, since 1976, since I've known him, has been a hero, a champion on NIH and funding. How we. And uh, he has that great relationship, both sides of the aisle. So with that, we thank him for being our hero, and uh, we wish him continued success, and um, we're very fortunate to have him as our voice in the United States Senate. Thank you.
think the, I think the senator is on his way to Marlboro, so I, I figured he needed at least an hour and a half to get there before, uh, <clears throat> so I wanted to give him enough time. Well, again, uh, it was terrific that the senator could find time to, uh, to be here. So now I'd like to invite our very distinguished panelists, if they could just come up to the uh, formal stage that we have here, and uh, we'll begin. Since we're all uh, eager to hear from our panelists, I'm going to give you a quick overview of your organization's work related to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, maybe, Jim, you could uh, start off and set the stage for our audience in terms of the scope of the disease in the region. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Jim. Um, and I, uh, it goes without, is this on? Uh, it goes without saying that uh, Senator Markey, uh, uh, since he was in Congress as a congressman, has, has just been a leading champion on this cause. And uh, at the Alzheimer's Association, we, we cannot be more thankful and appreciative. Um, so I've, uh, I've been uh, leading the Alzheimer's Association here in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and New England for 24 years. Um, along the way, like many of you in this room, my father uh, was diagnosed and passed away with, with the disease. So it has impacted me personally. Um, as well as professionally. Um, just really briefly, the Alzheimer's Association um, has been in existence for over 40 years. We're the leading national organization providing care and support uh, for um, uh, close to a million Americans annually. Uh, we are also uh, leaders in the research field. We're the largest private nonprofit funder of dementia science in the world. It's the one part of our mission that is actually international. Um, and currently, we have about $25 million in research grants deployed throughout New England. Um, and we're very active on a nonpartisan basis um, in the public policy arena. And we have um, partnered with Senator Markey and Senator Collins, uh, Congressman Smith, many of the, uh, the individuals that um, the senator mentioned. Just so you know, behind every wonderful elected official, you also need to have terrific advocates. We have a number of our volunteer advocates um, here um, uh, this afternoon um, at the lunch. And just so you, to frame it, every member of Congress in America has a volunteer advocacy team from the Alzheimer's Association assigned to them. We are nonpartisan, we are polite, but we are persistent. Um, so many of those accomplishments that the senator mentioned, uh, it was our honor to partner with him, um, with his colleagues um, across the nation. So uh, the senator really, I, we've heard a lot of the statistics, um, six and a half million Americans today living with this disease. Here in New England, in our six New England states, 300,000 people today, um, probably a little bit more, have Alzheimer's disease. And the other part of the, um, the metrics that we reference, but we don't necessarily give enough attention to, are the caregivers. So our estimate is about a two to one ratio of caregivers. These are caregivers that each and every day, um, like the um, uh, senator's father, are providing care and support for a loved one with Alzheimer's. So simple math is that's about 900,000 people here in New England, and that's going to grow to over a million by 2025, which is not that far away. Um, so a million New Englanders um, um, within the next two years, each and every day, are either living with this disease or directly caregiving, as many of you in this room are either are doing or have done. Um, the costs are phenomenal. It, on average, it costs um, $10,000 in out-of-pocket costs, just out-of-pocket costs uh, for people living with Alzheimer's disease. And the cost, the health care costs to our society, uh, well over um, $300 million, uh, billion, uh, today, and it's going to be close to a trillion dollars um, by the middle part of this century unless we can find some disease-modifying treatments, which I know we're going to talk about today. And I guess the last thing I'll say, because we do so much on the care and support side, we work with people living with dementia, we live with family caregivers, uh, we live with the children of people with dementia, is the, the toll that this takes on, on families. Um, it, is, it is so 
uh, challenging to watch your spouse or your parent, your loved one, um, slowly um, lose their cognitive ability. The caregiving demands start growing um, exponentially as that person is, is, is increasingly unable to take care of themselves. And then there's all of the costs and the choices um, that you have to make in terms of uh, the senator said he, um, uh, his dad was able to keep his wife at home, not always possible. So managing all of those challenges. One last quick story, I'll, I'll just leave you and then I'll, 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 I'll stop talking, but um, for a couple of years, we were, I was invited uh, by a fifth grade, uh, combined fifth grade class in the uh, town of Winchester, which is a, a, a suburban community north of Boston. And they do a readathon fundraiser every year, and they chose Alzheimer's. And I was surprised. I thought it would be Children's Hospital or Juvenile Diabetes. And um, anyway, I learned, I, I asked my staff, and I had all these games for kids about Alzheimer's, and I realized I didn't need any of that, because um, these kids knew. And about five minutes into talking to these children, I said, how many of you um, uh, fifth graders have a direct experience with Alzheimer's and dementia? A third. There were 60 kids sitting on the floor. Over 20 kids raised their hand. I did this three, they invited me three years in a row, then they stopped inviting us. But, uh, um, but every year it was the same percentage. And so think about that. These are kids who either have a parent or grandparent with dementia or, and I'll guarantee you, there are thousands of children in, across New England that every day are coming home from school, taking care of grandma and grandpa because their parents are still working. So this is really a disease that impacts multiple generations. Um, and I agree with the senator that failure is not an option. Thanks. My name is Greg Carter. I'm a professor at the Jackson Laboratory, um, as well as an affiliate professor at Tufts University School of Medicine. Um, for those who don't know, the Jackson Laboratory is a nonprofit research organization. We are based in Bar Harbor, Maine, Farmington, Connecticut, in Sacramento, California. Um, our mission is twofold. One is to provide resource, research resources for the broader research community. Uh, we have basically for about 100 years been developing new animal models for complex and common diseases. Uh, and, and our second mission is to do research ourselves, and really basic research, so we can understand the basic underlying causes of disease. Um, and when I say disease, we started as a, as a cancer research center um, in 1929 in Bar Harbor. Started with the idea that cancer was a genetic disease, which was not widely accepted at the time. Of course, we all know it is now. And, and from those days at, at the Jackson Lab, we've uh, expanded looking at other diseases like type 2 diabetes, um, rare diseases, uh, autoimmune diseases. And you know, I'll say mostly as a result of the NIH funding boost that the senator was discussing, we have exp greatly expanded our Alzheimer's disease research program in the, la the last 10 years. And so I'm, I'm part of that, uh, part of that expansion. My lab uh, has been set up to use these research resources we create, mostly animal models, mouse, mouse models, hopefully that will, will be uh, the right model for preclinical testing to find the treatments that we can then move into clinical studies. Um, and we also use a lot of uh, big data approaches. So I'm a computational biologist. And, and, and the other thing the senator mentioned that, that was really impactful was this idea of opening up data and opening up information across the NIH and really across the broader research community. That's empowered the research I do, um, the research that I, I, I do within a large network of collaborators across over a dozen institutions worldwide, um, where we are leveraging all this data and these animal models to try to understand what Alzheimer's really is what causes it, how it progresses, and ultimately how we can intervene. Um, and so I'm, I'm here um, as, as you know, part of this, this broader effort uh, around public funding as well as private funding through the Alzheimer's Association um, to, to get at uh, the basic causes so we can intervene and, and head off the disease, uh, hopefully prevent the disease. Thanks. Hopefully this is on. My name is Laura Cohen, um, and as you heard, I'm an Associate Vice President at Eli Lilly & Company, focusing on policy and access issues in our Alzheimer's space. 
Um, as you heard from Andrew, Eli Lilly and Company has been working on Alzheimer's disease for over 30 years. Um, and we're really unique in this space um, because we are approaching Alzheimer's both from the perspective of trying to develop disease-modifying therapies to potentially stop the progression of Alzheimer's disease, but we've also developed two really important diagnostic tools um, that can essentially identify the main hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, amyloid plaque um, and tau tangles through the use of positron emission tomography scans. Um, and uh, we're also now just starting um, to, to work in the, in the blood biomarker space as well, which I think is going to be a really important part um, of diagnosing Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so we're really excited to be here today. To, um, I think in terms of the disease-modifying side of our portfolio, as you heard from Andrew, we've got a number of different therapies in the pipeline from monoclonal antibodies to gene therapies, which is exactly what's coming to Boston. I think one that we're most excited about right now um, is our um, phase three amyloid-targeted um, um, monoclonal antibody called Denanumab. Um, some of you may have heard of this medication. Um, it is designed to remove amyloid plaque from the brains of individuals that are in mild cognitive impairment and the very early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Um, we're really pleased we uh, submitted that medication to the FDA for accelerated approval a little earlier this year, and we hope it's one of, of many uh, medications in this class that are coming forward. So, thank you. Hi everyone, thank you for being here. Um, I'm, I th I, I'm a basic scientist. Uh, I'm at Brown University. Um, I run the Brain Science Institute there. And one of the big um, initiatives that we um, have been working on for the last couple of years is to develop a new center for Alzheimer's disease research. And um, we have been incredibly fortunate um, at Brown to have uh, tremendous donors to the center, so we've raised about um, 40 million dollars right now, just in the last couple of years. That's enormous, but it also reflects the the need out there, the the incredible um, anxiety within the community. Of course, you know, to to want to really further uh, progress for basic research as well as clinical applications. And so, one of the key things that we are uh, trying to do, um, and I think we will succeed, is being able to draw young people in, the senator mentioned this, uh, as a really critically important piece of what we're doing for longevity, of course, um, and to really make it attractive for the younger scientists, the brilliant minds that we have in New England, more generally, um, tremendous, tremendous um, number of, of, of higher education institutes, private and public, in the New England area, and we just are incredibly fortunate to have so many wonderful, great minds. I think the influx of funding from the NIH has been huge, of course, for basic science, but it's also been really huge for young people to see that there is, in fact, a future if, if they go into basic research doing Alzheimer's disease. That was not true um, when I was deciding what I was going to do um, as a basic researcher. I didn't even think about it, even though many members of my family had been affected, because I didn't see that there was a path forward. So I think that as we think about the importance of, of the influx of funding for basic research, you also have to think about the importance of really being a, a magnet for the young people who are going to continue that torch, which I think is really, really, really important and shouldn't be underestimated. So we are um, really trying to pull in uh, a large number of really great minds, not just the young scientists, but existing scientists. So for example, in my institute, well, I shouldn't say my institute, in the Institute at Brown, um, we, we partner across applied mathematics, engineering, uh, molecular biology, neuroscience, cognitive science. Uh, and we pull in all of these uh, individuals and say, hey, there's a big problem here. We all need to be working together in order to be able to solve this. And so that might not sound traditional. You might wonder, well, why would an engineer, <laughs> why do we want an engineer to be able to think about how do we really tackle this incredible need within the community? We need devices. What about cognitive? Well, you know, Alzheimer's disease is fundamentally a disease of cognition. So we have to draw in the cognitive neuroscientists who traditionally, again, have not been interested <laughs> Uh, and that because there has not been the funding in, in being able to study cognition, there is now. So we're able to draw in really great cognitive neuroscientists into the field. So, I, I mean, just to close, and we can talk a little bit more about this, but I'm incredibly 
excited about that, the, the drawing of great minds from a number of different fields who we are going to need uh, broadly to be able to really participate um, in the drive towards finding cures. Um, and an area I think is incredibly important for drug development, which you've talked about, is being able to really diagnose with very granular um, uh, level uh, the different paths towards Alzheimer's disease. There are so many. Um, and being able to have very rapid feedback and much more granular um, assessment of the cognitive decline early on, very rapid feedback um, as one is treating with, with various therapies. And I think that this is a really important area that, that um, we are certainly um, building within the institute that I am. have the pleasure to direct. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, um, this is, it's been an honor to be here, I should say, you know, and thank you for the New England Council for inviting us. Thanks to our partners at Lilly for supporting this event and obviously my esteemed panelists here. I'm Mahar Radhakrishnan. I serve as a Chief Medical Officer at Biogen. I'm a physician by training. I come from very humble beginnings. I was born in India, and India is a country where um, conditions like dementia and Alzheimer's are seen as signs of aging. Right, and you heard Senator Markey talk about how parents are usually kept at home and not sent to uh, old age homes, as we call them, or senior citizen places. That's the kind of culture I come from. But as I started going into medical school and realized that this is not just normal aging, this is a pathology in the brain, as Andrew was talking about earlier, I think it makes one think about what should we be doing, what can we be doing, and how early should we intervene. So I am here representing the work we do at Biogen and also collectively with the rest of the community. The rest of the industry, our partners, the scientific academic community we have here on the table and the advocacy organizations which play a huge role in the healthcare ecosystem and how we can really collectively pay, play a role in meaningfully and measurably impacting patient outcomes. So a little bit more about Biogen. Biogen is one of the pioneers in neuroscience. We have products marketed in MS, SMA, and most recently got approval for aducanumab as the first monoclonal antibody uh, through the accelerated approval pathway in Alzheimer's disease. And I have to tell you, I'm quite excited, just like Laura said, about the potential that lecanemab can bring in partnership with our alliance partners at ASI. You all saw the top line results. And we are eager to come forward at the upcoming meeting, CTAD, which is going to be important to many of us, to really talk about more details on the data. We're standing at a brink of a revolution where you have Biogen, you have Lilly, you have Roche, and you have many other companies that are investing time, energy, resources, working with advocacy groups, working with uh, industry partners and academic partners to really get to the depths of, as Senator Markey said, what is actually happening in the brain? The pathology is not completely known. I was talking to Dr. Carter earlier. Is it amyloid? Is it tau? Is it something else? We're trying to get to it. And so at Biogen, we have programs that are targeting multiple pathways. We've got programs targeting amyloid. We've got antisense oligonucleotides and oral molecules targeting tau and many other mechanisms. Because at the end of the day, we're all in this together. We are a company that's focused on neurological diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, as well as adjacent immunological conditions. And I have to say, I feel proud to be sitting in this room with my fellow colleagues and colleagues from other companies to say we are fearless, we are resilient, and we never give up when it comes to really serving the needs of the patients. Thank you. You know, we've heard so much about the cost, the human cost uh, of all time is, and also the cost of um, unpaid caregiving. I mean, if you add it up, it's about 600 billion and just rising. And I think already it's been mentioned that by 2050, um, the total is gonna be nearly one trillion, one trillion dollars each year. So I guess one of the questions that comes to mind for a full panelist is, just how do we address the economic uh, burden of Alzheimer's disease, both the treatment and um, the care management? So, Jim, you want to start? Uh... Sure. Um, I mean, I think uh, in part the economic argument uh, is if we, 
uh, the hope, is, I think, with these early dis disease-modifying drugs, if we can intervene early, is at least um, th these are not cures. Uh, Lacanumab, which uh, is very hopeful with those top-line results that uh, were just recently released. Um, but if we can delay disease progression um, by six months, one year, two years, that means from an economic point, uh, not, to, not to talk about the quality of life for the person with dementia who maybe will be cognitively healthy enough to, uh, as, as one of our advocates has talked about, to see his 25, 26-year-old sons get married. But in terms of forestalling um, what would be a uh, cost to, um, uh, but frankly, both the, the kind of regular health care system as well as long-term care and community care. We know people with Alzheimer's and dementia, not only is, is long-term care expensive, but um, people with dementia cost more in terms of health care utilization. So we know that someone with Alzheimer's and diabetes is more expensive than someone with diabetes who's cognitively healthy. And you can go down all the major chronic diseases, and Alzheimer's is like an accelerator impact on the cost. So I think when we look at um, investing in treatments, there is the human benefit, but we also have to be looking at trying to take a, make a dent in that trillion dollar cost um, by the middle part of this century. That as we start seeing these medications um, get approved, not only by the FDA, but by CMS coverage, which is essential, um, that uh, we will start seeing hopefully the curve of this disease start going down. We'll see people living longer with greater cognitive health. We'll have greater utilization because of Alzheimer's and dementia in our healthcare system. So I think that, to me, is, is a very compelling economic argument. It does mean at times we have to spend a little bit more now to save a lot down the road. Um, but uh, that's, a, that's an investment I'd be willing to make with my tax dollars. Mm -hmm. Maha, do you yeah, get your no, hand thank up? Thank you. I just, I'll build on what Jim just so eloquently said. I think um, you know, it goes without saying that we invest a lot in R&D. So in 2020 alone, Biogen spent about $4 billion in R&D, and much of what is actually gone into Alzheimer's research and development. But to Jim's point, I think before we get into the economic value-based argument, we need to think about what we all collectively need to do in terms of the medical and health outcomes value of the programs we bring forward. Simply put, what does an improvement in certain points on the CDR sum of boxes scale mean, or the ADIS COG mean, or the ADCS ADL mean, which essentially is activities of daily living? So how are we able to slow down the progression of symptoms when it relates to patients' independence? Things like using the bathroom, things like being able to do finances on their own, things like being independent at home. You heard Senator Markey talk about how his mother was at home for 13 plus years before she passed away and succumbed to this devastating fatal illness. So I think we collectively, it behooves us to really talk about the value proposition as a whole. So when you look at the medical and the health economic value and then translate that into the, the price differential in terms of direct and indirect costs, including the caregiver burden, that was mentioned many times in the, this, this afternoon, one-fifth of the time of a caregiver usually is spent taking care of patients with Alzheimer's. So we gotta factor all of this in. And to Jim's very well said point, we have to then talk about how do these costs come down over the course of time. It does take investment in the, in the beginning, but it's also going to take a whole lot of advocacy to explain to people what the value of a disease-modifying medication is. It's not a symptomatic. It's not something that's going to offer transient effect. It's not a cure. But it is a way to really slow down the progression of disease and give time back to patients and their families. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to participate? Sure. So just, I think, two other points to build off of. Um, I think Can you first, just bring the mic a little? Oh, yeah. yeah. Better? Yep. Um, I think to the last point that Jim made, um, I, in, in terms of understanding really the value of these monoclonal antibodies, patients are going to have to have access to them once they are approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Um, and I know we'll talk about this a little bit more, I think, a, a bit further down in the panel, um, but we really do have to ensure that the way um, in which CMS covers these drugs, of course, as you think about where do Alzheimer's disease patients get their health insurance coverage from? The vast, vast majority um, are insured by the Medicare program just because of the age that Alzheimer's generally begins to onset. Um, as some of you may know, um, the agency earlier this year uh, essentially established a national level co coverage policy that severely, severely restricts the way in which patients can access 
all of the medicines in this class. So it, it, it impacts, of course, Biogen's drug. It will impact ours if we receive FDA approval, um, as well as ASI's um, alicanumab as well. And so we really have to ensure that patients um, have access to these drugs in order to understand the value proposition um, that they bring. Um, I think the other piece here, just in terms of, um, of how do we kind of get our arms around the economic burden of Alzheimer's, Early and accurate diagnosis is a huge piece of this puzzle. Um, so as, as some of you may know, some of the sort of initial um, hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, amyloid plaque in particular, begins to build in the brains of Alzheimer's disease patients 10 to 20 years before they ever begin to show cognitive symptoms of, of Alzheimer's disease. And so it is really imperative that we begin to identify and, and diagnose people much earlier um, in the progression of the disease. Right now, Alzheimer's disease is often misdiagnosed. Um, it's often underdiagnosed. Um, but we have these really important diagnostic tools. We've got to make sure folks have access to, um, and I think that will be a very important part of managing the economic burden of this disease is really diagnosing earlier, so that one, from a, from a therapeutic perspective, folks are getting access to these, these uh, monoclonal antibodies um, that are really designed for the early stages of Alzheimer's disease, but even absent therapeutics, I mean, there is deep value in, in having an early and accurate diagnosis. It gives you time to plan, to engage in, not, in behavioral interventions, and um, so I do think that that is a, a major piece of this as well. You know, Laura, you, you sort of uh, touched on it. The, the question that someone asked me to ask you is, what steps can the, uh, the federal government take to improve coverage of the Alzheimer's drugs? Is there an opportunity to shift or supplement funding and attention from care to better drug coverage? Sure. So let me talk just briefly um, about sort of the landscape of access for um, uh, disease-modifying therapies, and I'll also talk just a bit about some of the diagnostic issues. So as I mentioned, um, uh, earlier this year, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, uh, released a policy, um, and this applies to anyone who receives their insurance coverage through the Medicare program. It could be regular fee-for-service, you could be enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan, and, and what that policy says is the only way in which a patient can have access to an FDA-approved drug in this class, this is the class being um, amyloid-targeted monoclonal antibodies, is you either need to be enrolled in a clinical trial to receive coverage for that drug, um, or upon traditional FDA approval, you've got to be enrolled um, in a patient registry. Um, I want to maybe just pause here and, and uh, let that sink in. Uh, there is no other therapeutic area where CMS has said, after FDA approval, let's be clear, these are drugs approved by the Food and Drug Administration, you still either need to be enrolled in a clinical trial to receive that drug, or at traditional approval, you've got to be enrolled in what's called a registry study. That is a massive, massive access barrier. Um, if we think about what that means for patients, one, you may not live near a clinical trial site um, to be able to enroll and access these drugs. And all of the drugs in this class, they are infused. That means you actually have to go in person to receive them. These are not medications you can take at home. So think about the burden on patients as well as caregivers, um, trying to get your patient to a clinical trial site that may not be near where you live. Um, you also heard Senator Markey talk about the fact that there are tremendous race and ethnicity disparities in this disease. Um, restricting access to these products, either in the clinical trial setting or in a registry study, those will exacerbate the underlying disparities in disease because, again, you may not live near a clinical trial site. You may not want to enroll in, in a clinical trial um, because I think it can be very confusing for patients to hear, this drug has FDA approval, but you still have to be enrolled in a trial to receive coverage. Um, I think the other piece I'll, I'll pause on here and then happy to, to pass it over as well, is that when we're talking about a true clinical trial, um, it, folks can be randomized to placebo. So we can be in a situation where a patient is attempting to access an FDA approved medication, they enroll in a clinical trial, and they are receiving placebo, which is sort of a mind-boggling concept. In generally speaking, when a drug receives Food and Drug Administration approval, whether that's accelerated approval or traditional approval, they can access that medication um, wherever they wish, at their physician's office, at an infusion center, and they know they're actually getting the therapy, not placebo. Um, this is a, a real access problem, um, and what we really need is for CMS to revise this policy um, to provide clear um, access to these products once they are approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Mm -hmm. 
I, I could definitely build on the excellent points made by Laura here. I think the other thing that we need to be mindful of is, although I think, Andrew, you mentioned 6 million patients with Alzheimer's in the U.S. currently diagnosed, it's not in any way that the, once a product gets approved from any of our sites that all 6 million are going to go open the doors and say, I need to be treated tomorrow. We need to think about the infrastructure challenges. Now we've heard both Andrew, Laura, and others talk about the complexity of diagnosis. It starts off with a simple memory or cognition test, but then needs to go through an algorithm of decision making where you've got to go through biomarkers. And I have to thank my colleagues at the industry and academia and advocacy groups for working hand in hand in terms of what kind of diagnostics do we need? Blood base, do we need CSF, do we need PET imaging? Right, and I go back to my days uh, when Ovid was one of the companies that Lily ended up acquiring. Is the infrastructure is easier said than understood? Okay, so we have to really explain to the CMS two things. One is the authority of the regulators is being questioned, and there seems to be a differential approach of looking at oncology, HIV, infectious diseases versus neurology, and thirdly, the infrastructure today needs to be developed needs to be developed, and even more so when it comes to the underserved and underrepresented communities. So part of what the national coverage determination that Laura referred to was for the patients to go on to either a randomized control study or a, or a registry. And imagine someone living in, I'm, I'm not taking, don't take this in the wrong way, Montana or some remote parts of the country where they do not have a center where they can go and enroll in a study. Are we going to deprive these patients of products that have gone through a rigorous regulatory approval? I mean, to me, as a physician, as someone who has older parents, who myself could succumb to this disease one day, this is just not acceptable. Are there questions from... Uh the audience, because I have a bunch of questions, but I'd rather have you ask some questions. Lenny? This microphone from Sean. Ira Goldman Lantheus, right, and also Lenny. with the uh, Medical Imaging Technology Alliance. Um, Laura, you've you know talked about a very important problem that CMS coverage, both of the disease modifying medications and particularly of the imaging agents. Um, there is a partial answer to this, which is the FIND Act, uh, which wouldn't address the coverage issue, which CMS still has to deal with, but even when the PET imaging agents are covered, after they go off pass-through, they're inadequately reimbursed. So I would urge um, and anyone, and I know the Alzheimer's Association is a supporter of the FIND Act, which is HR 4479 and S2609, it would be a very important step to address, make sure that diagnostics uh, imaging agents are available. So uh, ask for everyone's support to advance this important legislation. Jim? Uh, so I, the, thank you for that. I, I think you raise a very good point. I, this is a very complex disease, and so there are multiple, um, there, there is the whole uh, diagnostic uh, component right now, which right now is, uh, in terms of these monoclonal antibodies, determining that there's amyloid A beta in the brain, so that's a PET scan or maybe a cerebral spinal fluid um, uh, draw. We've, uh, it's been mentioned uh, blood biomarkers. So I think not only the drug, but what, you know, the, actually funding the mechanism so that people can actually get the treatment. The other thing I think, though, we do have to keep in mind is that I do think the technology of delivery is going to continue to advance and change. So we can't get stuck and say, oh, my goodness, for the next 25 years, we have to figure out how do we pay for PET imaging. Yes, we do need to have that coverage, but I know I think Cantamerimab is, is already doing a clinical trial on a, on a, a shot um, injection. Um, hopefully the blood biomarker research, which Alzheimer's Association has been very involved in funding, will start bearing fruit. Um, it is now available in, in the research clinical trial. It's not yet um, been approved for uh, primary care practice. But, you know, I think if we imagine looking forward to the day when you can actually go to your primary a care doctor, you can get a blood test, you can determine um, that you are very likely going to be developing Alzheimer's, and then we have treatments that that doctor can then prescribe um, to you that will, that will start dramatically slowing the progression. That's not such a fantasy. We're really, I think Senator Markey said this, we're really at the, yeah. we, we are at the, the front of a new frontier um, um, in the treatment. It is exciting, it is frustrating, because I know um, my colleagues here in the pharma and biotech, um, there are 
very valid barriers that have been thrown up, but we are going to overcome those. And I also think that some of the technological advances are going to are going to um, advance us further. Other questions from yes, ma'am. You want to identify yourself? Sure, Jill Homer Stewart with the Jackson Laboratory. I swear this is not a softball question for Dr. Carter. <laughs> um, I, I work in government relations. I work in Washington, and I do a lot of advocacy on NIH funding for basic science. And one of the pushback questions that we get is that if we were to dramatically increase the funding for Alzheimer's research, there wouldn't necessarily be the quality of, of studies ready to go right now. And so I suppose this is maybe a softball for Greg, but Diane, maybe you would want to answer. Is the infrastructure there if we were to, say, double the, um, this is a hypothetical, if we were to hypothetically double the amount of money that we put towards Alzheimer's research for the f coming fiscal year, are there the quality of research studies available ready to go? Um, you know, I, uh, yes. <laughs> um, again, I, I, perhaps I'll, I'll answer it in two different ways. One is to come back to my previous point, which is that we have a, we have a limited number of people who are, who, whose lives career is focused on Alzheimer's disease research, okay? That is not the pool <laughs> of people that could be focused on Alzheimer's disease research. And so more funding means more people um, and a faster way, I mean, uh, uh, to accelerate the identifying the pathways that need to be targeted by by Jeff, Eli Lilly and other companies who haven't yet been mentioned. So, so, so I think the answer is absolutely categorically yes. You know, we're all running small, I mean, it's, you know, in academic research, we're all actually running little businesses. You know, I have my own research group. I have to think, how am I gonna, you know, what am I gonna work on? What am I qualified to do? What do I think is a big, big, big problem in the world that I would love to try and solve? And then you, you say, well, do I have funding to do that? Am I able to pull in students who have qualities that I need in order to be able to take on these big questions? If the answer to any one of those things is no, but for another area of research is yes, despite the fact that I have been you know, affected by Alzheimer's disease and I would love nothing more than to do it. You can't do it if you don't have the funding. So, so, so categorically, yes, yes, there are people. There is the desire, there is the need, um, and you know, w we need the funding, okay, yeah. Yeah, thanks, so I completely agree, yes. Um, and, and I think we could immediately use that funding because Alzheimer's is so complicated. Um, the more we've studied the brains of people who have died from Alzheimer's, um, even compared to people who you know, were at advanced ages, at the same, died at the same age, um, the brains look very different, and, and different in many, many ways. It's, there's amyloid and there's tau, yes, but there's a lot of other things going on. There's inflammation, there's metabolic differences. Um, basically, any sort of biology you can think of is probably relevant in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. And bringing people in with those expertise from those fields, people study these things, they just don't do it in the context of neurodegenerative diseases. Um, more neuroscientists who understand you know, synaptic function, we need to understand synaptic dysfunction and decay in Alzheimer's disease. Um, people who understand inflammation, uh, uh, immunologists who can sort of move from what they classically study, which is you know, response to, uh, to viruses or, or environmental insult, how, how do you think about the response to pathology in the brain? Because we see that act, active. And so if, if suddenly the, the funding doubled, we could easily open up the field and enable more people to come in and work on this. And you know, I'm, I'm proof of this. I did not start my lab to study Alzheimer's disease. I started my lab at the Jackson Laboratory to study how these you know, age-related common complex diseases happen genetically. And I got into Alzheimer's disease partially because I could do a lot in Alzheimer's disease because of the expanded funding. And we are now you know, part of a program. I, I interact daily, weekly with over a dozen institutions, collaborations across these large, um, large-scale funding programs. There, you know, m much of it is the small business model, but 
what the extended funding allows us to do is to move beyond that to almost sort of a corporate research structure where we put together these big grants across you know, seven, eight institutions where we all lend our expertise, um, the resources we have at each of our sites, and we all work together. And that's not only expensive in terms of funding all the individual expertise, but it's also expensive to fund us to all work together. There's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be built. Um, in particular, you know, I'm very focused on data science, and data infrastructure is very expensive. Right? It's not just that we need to go to a cloud and buy cloud time. We need experts who know how to deal with the data, know how to set up the data so, such that all of us other scientists working on those data understand exactly what it is, because it's very complicated. Um, and so we work with a lot of partners. We do this a lot at the Jackson Lab, too, to fund experts to set up those systems so that everyone can benefit from the research we're doing, and then, you know, of course, can propagate those data and that research across the community. That's tremendously expensive. Um, it's something that we hit roadblocks on even now with our funding situation. So, yeah, I would say we, we definitely t need to drive that more. Um, the other the other thing I'll note is with, with all, of, all of these different biological contributions that are going on in an Alzheimer's affected individual, um, for every one of those, it sort of opens up novel ideas for treatment, right? So you're no longer necessarily focused on amyloid and or tau. Obviously, we need to be focused on amyloid and tau, but when you think about inflammation and the response to amyloid and tau in the brain, if we go to the genetics, it, it's not just a response, it's actually causal. People have genetic differences that make their inflammatory response either good or bad in the light of this neuro, uh, neuropathology. Uh, and that opens up a lot of avenues for treatment that actually don't have a lot of bandwidth right now or a lot of funding right now um, because we are focused on the primary markers. Um, and so again, expanding funding would allow more of those uh, therapeutic ideas to arise as well. Jim's going to take just a, a crack at it. Just yeah. a quick point to, to add what was said. I, I know this is the case with the Alzheimer's Association's philanthropic research funding, and I, I'm, I know it's also the case at NIH. Um, we are not funding um, the number of qualified proposals that are being submitted. So we don't have enough money, both at the federal government and in, I can speak for the Alzheimer's Association, for our private philanthropy, to fund all of the proposals that initially um, clear our initial analysis that this is a worthwhile endeavor. So, so another way to, to think of the answer to that question, there's a lot of unfunded science out there um, that that should be funded so that these multiple approaches, um, as, as Greg mentioned, um, beyond just even amyloid and tau, um, can be fully uh, researched and hopefully eventually um, get into the um, biotech pharma clinical trial um, uh, pathways. Okay. We have time for uh, maybe one or two more questions. Yes, sir. You want to wait for the mic? Sure. Hi, I'm Hector Montesino. I'm a volunteer with the Alzheimer's Association. Um, Senator Markey expressed, um, you know, we know that diverse communities are um, highly more affected than other communities, and um, how can we, um, how can all of you engage um, the these communities more and and make them more aware of their, uh, you know, their high risk levels. Full panel? Maybe I'll start, and I'm sure each one of my fellow panelists will have uh, to add. I think it's a phenomenal question, and thank you, because very often what we don't think about is, first of all, the stigma associated with the diagnosis, and obviously the stigma associated with if the NCD were to go through and patients were asked to go on clinical trials again, am I being treated as a guinea pig? That question comes in people's minds just because of their lack of awareness, right? They are not sensitized to the fact that they are being put to testing a treatment that already has been approved. So what you will see from us and many of my colleagues here is we are doing our best to really increase the enrollment of patients in our clinical studies. So in the Clarity AD study for lecanemab, the top line results which was presented, 25% of patients come from either the African American or Latinx communities, which is quite reflective of the Medicare database in terms of where the diverse populations are. And the other thing that we're trying to do in our post-marketing requirement study for aducanumab, which we call as Envision, we've got a target of 18% of African-American Latinx. So how are we going about recruiting them? Because they are not easy to find. So we are partnering with the likes of the National Minority Quality Forum, or NMQF, as you call it. We are 
partnering with Latinx advocacy groups, the Alzheimer's Association is one, the, and, and many of the advocacy groups to really, and also with payers to really look at going down to the zip codes, where are these patients and providers located? Once you find out the demographics, then our teams are essentially zeroing in on that in terms of what kind of education efforts, what kind of community awareness efforts do you need, what kind of, uh, how do you train the not just the physicians, but the treatment team members to be sensitized to the nuances of the cultural differences in these patients. We go to the point of even reaching out to uh, faith-based communities, churches, and community centers. Right, So we have to really spread the net out wide in terms of how do we reach them because our job is cut out for us. We do know that they, there is a disproportionate number of people coming from underrepresented populations that are falling victims to this disease. But I, I know there is a lot happening, so maybe Laura or others. And Sure. So I, I think let me just talk briefly about two things that we're doing at Lilly specifically to improve um, diverse representation in our clinical trials. The first um, is that one of our newest trials, which is looking at the use of denanumab in what's called the preclinical population, so these are uh, younger individuals, is we're using decentralized clinical trial designs. What that means is that we're allowing folks to complete a lot of study activities from home. So we're actually giving people tablets and they're doing cognition testing. Essentially, anything that um, can be done at home, um, we're, we're trying to do in the home setting at this point um, to make enrollment in trials um, easier for individuals. And we really do believe that that will help um, increase the representation in our clinical trials moving forward. The other really interesting thing that we're doing um, at Lilly, um, and this actually comes from our time um, in the COVID-19 pandemic, um, is that we actually have a fleet of mobile recreational vehicles, so exactly what you're thinking, RVs, um, that are outfitted to do screenings for our clinical trials in the community. So we load these buses up, we drive them into communities of color, into uh, lower economic areas, and we actually do the screenings in the community. So as opposed to expecting the community to come to us to do our screening and our trials, we are trying to get directly to them. Um, just recently, they were out in Chicago, um, and there's plans to do these sort of across the country because we've had so much success in actually bringing the screening to um, our, our diverse patient populations. Um, and, and much like Maha said, we're also doing a number of things with our advocacy organizations, um, with faith-based organizations, to help folks understand um, sort of what it, the disease is, to not be afraid to enroll in clinical trials, and sort of the benefit that can really be developed here um, for a number of communities. Hey, anyone? I just wanted to add a couple of things and to state the obvious that there is a lot of mistrust. Yeah. Um, the history of, um, you know, the, uh, this in the United States is, is uh, grim and not pleasant. And so I think that there's just a huge amount that still needs to be done in order to build trust within different communities. So that's number one. Um, you know, as, as I'm in higher ed and I work with students all the time, we have to bring in a hugely diverse population of students to be able to um, uh, do the research. I mean, I, I think at every single level, we have to really be um, asking ourselves, you know, uh, you know, are we, have we really done what we need to do? Are we really working hard? Are we really building bridges into communities? Because it will make us more excellent. I mean, we're, you know, the, the only way to achieve excellence is through a really diverse, inclusive group of people working together. And so they're the people that need to be in the communities. Um, mm -hmm. That's the fastest way to build trust. Um, and it's the fastest way to connect. So I think we haven't done a good job. Um, I think there's a long way to go. Uh, the awareness and the conversation right now is good, but it's not enough. Um, you know, so, I, so I think it's a really important question, but, but we need to think about that at every single level. The researchers, um, you know, the point of care, uh, the people going in and doing outreach into communities. So key, key question. Um, and the other thing I would just add is, you know, there are so many uh, risk factors uh, that we, we already know of for, for dementia, mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's disease, um, lower education level. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that? Did you want to yeah. add? Being, uh, you know, black, being Hispanic. Um, you know, so, so I think that, you know, these, these things are 
critically important, high, untreated high blood pressure. So, so there's a lot of need, there's a lot of interventions that, that should be done immediately, because we know what they are. Um, but yeah, effort, lots to do. <laughs> uh, incredibly important question. Thank you. For uh, I'll just add, Hector, first of all, thank you for your question uh, to my colleagues. Uh, you know, I think at the Alzheimer's Association, we're very involved in partnering with organizations, uh, faith communities, and others, at, both on a national level and local level, uh, representing diverse populations. I'll just mention on the research side, uh, you know, frankly, um, um, kudos uh, to um, uh, Biogen ASI for that 25% um, diverse population in, in the, the Lacanumab um, clinical trial. I think we need to keep setting those high standards and doing everything we can to meet those. Um, Alzheimer's Association actually has a national lifestyle uh, study, sort of if you think of it, a right lifestyle uh, recipe called U.S. Pointer. Brown University is, is, is one of the, the centers, and we have also a 20, nationwide 25 percent uh, goal in diverse populations. And the last thing I'll mention is that there is a, a I know this is a, um, Jim, um, this, this is a Washington, D.C. connection organization. Uh, we do have an important piece of legislation. Senator Markey um, is a co-sponsor of something called the ENACT Act, and it would provide funding for, there are about over 24, 25 Alzheimer's disease research centers across the country, and um, uh, many of them are, are involved in clinical research, and so this would provide financial incentives and funding um, to um, improve and increase diverse recruitment for clinical trials at these centers all across the country. If you think of all the major teaching hospitals in America, many of them um, have these Alzheimer's disease research centers. So there is also, I think, a public policy um, approach uh, to increasing diversity, which is, is critically important. We need to improve when, we, when we're looking at drugs uh, to deal with cognitive impairment, we need to be moving forward drugs that are going to benefit all Americans and not just a subsection of them. Yeah, this is all great. And just the one thing I would add is in addition to, you know, socially interacting with uh, diverse communities better, we need to understand the environments in those communities better. We need to understand exposures. Um, so Diane touched on this, the risk factor profile for Alzheimer's disease is known to some degree, but not understood, like a lot of the basic science. Uh, and you know, and this is hard for me to admit. I'm a geneticist. We like genetics. Genetics is very useful because it links to a molecule, and and you know, we can think about therapeutic interventions on a molecular level. But when you actually think about the risk for Alzheimer's disease, it might be half genetic, and and the rest of it is probably environmental. And so we've been starting to do more experiments around this. Um, and, and looking at more of the human studies where, you know, it's really hard to do this because we're dealing with historical data, right? The people who are susceptible to Alzheimer's right now didn't grow up in the current environments. They grew up in environments decades ago. And so we have to sort of piece this together and there are big efforts in the field to do this to try to sort out, you know, sort of at a zip code scale what the environmental exposures are and what they have been in the past. And so building on this, we started to do some experiments, just I can mention in the last few months, to expose our animal models to, you know, low concentrations of lead in their water or arsenic or other chemicals that have differential exposure and you know primarily um, are more present in lower income areas and we've just started looking at the brains in mice that have been exposed and you know this isn't massive lead exposure this is a little bit in their water and you can already see the changes in the molecular profile of those brains when you look at the proteins and the genes and it it looks a lot like Alzheimer's disease and we don't yet know if it's specific we don't know how that's going to affect their aging and and their ultimate susceptibility to dementia but you know, the more we understand lived environments, even physical environments, um, I think the better that not only can we understand the disease, but we can figure out ways that people are susceptible and ways to treat them more accurately. Hmm. Well, with that, um, I'd be remiss in not saying, um, as somebody who represents New England and all the industries, we are blessed to have such world premier uh, research facilities right here in New England. And uh, I'll make a bold prediction that if we do uh, eradicate Alzheimer's, it'll be done here in New England. And uh, because we're a leader uh, with all our life sciences and uh, world premier medical institutional uh, facilities. So we are blessed to have these extraordinary and gifted uh, individuals um, working on this very, very dreadful disease that has impacted millions of people throughout this country as well as 
you know, caregivers who have given up billions of their hours to take care of their loved ones. So I applaud all of them. It's been an informative discussion. I thank all of them. I thank Eli Lilly and Company for extraordinarily being generous and stepping up to the plate and providing this forum. I thank all of you for, for being here and being part of the discussion. And, and uh, with that, I hope you have a, a great day. But again, thanks to all of you for uh, participating.